thank you so much for having me here. Um, it, the program, the uh, design of the Nature Culture Seminar, it's really outstanding. So um, I imagine you've had some very good talks uh, so far. And it's um, an honor to be here to contribute to them. So thanks for bringing me. Um, th so this, this talk today draws on empirical work in Guatemala. And it's a kind of strange approach to multi-species studies, but I'll just I'll just start and dive into it, and you'll see. Um, so taxonomy is a practice. Can I actually just first ask? Can you hear me in the back? Is this working? Okay. So taxonomy is a practice with histories and cultures, but this is not often readily apparent. Instead, taxonomy gains strength through its claims of cataloging the universal world, the universal truth of a singular world. While many biologists are nuanced in their depiction of species as fluid, always becomings, a persistent use of the concept of species evokes fixed and measurable degrees of relatedness. The human is more closely related to animals than it is to plants, to mammals than to fish, to primates than to cattle, and so on. The specificities of a species category might change, but the premise of conventional taxonomy is that life can be classified through fixed objective properties to be mapped and known with the eventual certainty of ontological being that is a cow, that is an animal, that is a human. So this talk today is inspired by the participant observation that meat can take ontologically diverse forms, not all of which align with an understanding of meat predicated on a mononaturalist phylogeny in which definable and orderable parts are linked together in a singular world. While conducting, slow down, okay, yep, yes, I can. While conducting ethnographic, and remind me, I'll, if you just move your hand, then, then I'll see, because I, I appreciate and I apologize that you know, I'm here talking to you in English, so I appreciate that um, I could even do this. So, so wave and just remind me that. that um. While conducting ethnographic field work in the highlands of Guatemala, I learned that meat was many things, and along with this, that there were many ways to participate in the doing and undoing of similarity and difference. In the encounters with meat that I describe, not only were distinctions between human and animal often irrelevant, but the pathways of inclusion and exclusion constituting this object of meat also varied. This observation is situated within a burgeoning field of multi-species scholarship. This field, which owes much to a tradition of feminist anthropology, has usefully decentered the human as the site at which relations originate unsettling, taken for granted assumption about knowledge and its holders. Yet if the social science turn to species, or rather multi-species, is to be a point of departure from the limitations of humanism, species must not be understood as a naturally ordered essence of blood or genetics, but as an occurrence of coherence situated amid ever transforming divisions and connections. So an occurrence of coherence. Many multi-species focused authors have themselves argued or would otherwise agree with the claim that species pertains to the making of relations. But discussions of species continues to be haunted by the specter of Linnaean taxonomy, which catalogs fixed types, some lucky ones defined as naturally human, while others are not. So this talk today, I hope, will illustrate that stable distinctions between human and other species are precisely what deserves to be challenged. The stakes of this discussion are high in the place that I worked. In Guatemala and in other places today, there's considerable political incitement to embrace multiculturalism. In the language of this politics, the bodies and beliefs of various cultures aggregate to make a harmonious whole. Animal, animals might well join this vision. We are all, in the, as this logic goes, we are all linearly connected through an underlying similarity of kind. Yet belying the promise of peaceful integration, variation exists that cannot and should not be so easily disappeared. Elizabeth Povinelli and Charles Hale have in different ways shown how multiculturalism carries with it the stale smell of essentialist discourses of blood and type that continue to pin people down. The call for multi-species ethnography, if taken as a call to focus anthropological attention on other than human Linnaean species, runs the risk of similarly reasserting, homogenizing, and ontologically violent modes of ordering. Through ethnographic analysis of meat and its classifications in the three cases that follow, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to illustrate that not only can there be no steadfast certainty 
about who is human and who is beast, but that the parameters of these categories themselves do not travel smoothly. Despite widespread classification of species into fixed inherent positions of a singular natural order, there is no re register of equivalence on which bodies and beings can be steadfastly pinned. Species are never given, but they are done through, and this is to quote Donna Haraway, a dance of kin and kind that varies not just between localities here and there, but also within them. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the methods and orientation that frame this talk. And also just to let you know, what I'm, I'm planning to run through three cases, one focused on animal, one on family, and one on collective. And then after, I'll give the kind of some empirical data and then I'll do a little bit of analysis and in the, in the end, I'll try to wrap this all together with some conclusions. So first, just a little more on my methodological orientation. Um, to highlight that the power of multi-species scholarship lies not in its attention to classically conceived Linnaean species, so worms and anemones, dogs or mushrooms. I've drawn the material from this article from the everyday experience of living and eating with families in Guatemala. I focus on a series of fairly quotidian events surrounding the eating of meat to illustrate that everyday interactions have much to teach us about the sciences of classification. So part of the, here is a critique to the field of science studies because I find it a mistake that so much energy on, on what is science is focused on people who are explicitly, objectively you know, agreed upon scientists. So the arguments that I make have been shaped by ethnographic fieldwork I conducted in a small village in 99, in 2001, in 2003, 2005, and 2007. All of that was summer pre-field field work. But most of the material I present comes from research on dietary practices in Guatemala's second largest city. It's a city called Shela that took place during a period of 16 months, and this was um, 2008 and 2009 was when I was there. I've been back in 2010 and 2013 as well. But this stuff comes from 2008 and 9. I lived with several families during my field work to learn about the everyday negotiations of procuring and preparing food, employing a research strategy perhaps best characterized by Renato Rosaldo as deep hanging out. Since meat was a daily concern of those with whom I shopped, cooked, and ate, it became of interest to me as well. In focusing on meat, however, I realized that my understanding of it as a stable object, the flesh of animal, as if flesh and animal were each straightforward things, it did not map easily onto the way in which meat emerged around me. At issue was not just that the category didn't smoothly translate across the many cultures and languages that surrounded me, but also that my attempt to treat meat as a knowable object did not align with the ways this object persistently moved in and out of salience. So my, uh, this observation, as many of you probably know, stems from long-standing ethnographic attention to the challenge of smoothly translating concepts from site to site. Marilyn Strathern articulated, it, articulated this challenge well in No Nature, No Culture. So she wrote of traveling to Papua New Guinea with an interest in how Hagen divided nature from culture. Yet in carrying out field work, she learned that Hagen did not deploy these concepts. So rather than contest the definitional <coughs> parameters, that is, rather than argue with the meanings of the terms, her observation undermined their universality, and in doing so, created openings to examine what other techniques of division might be relevant both in Papua New Guinea and in the so-called West. A lesson of this research, which shaped my fieldwork approach, is that we cannot take practices of connection in addition to categories themselves for granted. To be clear, it's not my aim today to make a general argument about how meat is categorized in the world, nor is it to characterize Guatemalan beliefs about meat. The materials I provide have been framed by the years I've spent carrying out research in, in a place where ethnic, and in, in, in the place I worked, you had Quiche, Mom, Spanish, and German. There was a German influence there. So you had ethnic, class, and geospatial identities that have entangled and divided in historically complex ways. But I'm not here to, to deploy the materials with the aim of teaching you about the region of Guatemala so much as to think about this process of classification. So it's not a standard ethnological approach that way. Um, and hopefully we'll, in that, we'll be keeping with some of the other talks that you've had. Um, Guatemala's brutal three-decade genocide in which more than 200,000 residents, a majority of whom spoke Mayan languages, were tortured and killed at the hands of state and paramilitary groups has affected the concerns of my talk, as has the country's enduring legacy of colonial exploitation with its slippery, bloody boundaries between the human and the less than human. This kind of spectacular violence, though, is not really, it, you'll see it's not the focus of my talk today. Instead, I focus on the mirrored and fluid organization of everyday realities in a few specific cases so as to ch challenge 
the continued predominance of Euro-American modes of ordering in academic discourse and analysis. When I turn to address the commonly deployed categories of social theory, gender, race, and class, which I'm going to get to in a minute, my argument, and you'll see it's not that these don't exist, either in Guatemala or in other places. It is rather that they don't exist in the same way or to the same effect from situation to situation. Anthropologists have long illustrated that identities do not have a singular core simply waiting to be properly defined. My examination of meat, and I realize that you haven't even heard this yet, so I'm giving you quite a lot of lead up to it. Um, it, it seeks to add to the, this body of research by illustrating how the techniques through which identities are made to cohere themselves vary. So the issue is not just where boundaries are drawn or who is what to, is added to particular categories, but what a boundary or relation can be taken to mean. As, a, as I'm hoping to show in these cases, I'm getting to them right now, similarity and difference can take many forms. And that kind of lengthy lead up is because the cases, if you, when I read them, if, you're, if you don't have that in mind, they might seem rather ordinary. So I'm hoping to sort of give you a sense of, of how to um, destabilize their ordinariness. Here I go. Cries of demo, 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 announce their arrival to the market, at the market to passengers on a tired stream of microbuses that wind through streets dense with shoppers, sellers, and crates of good. Demo, demo, demo. La Democracia is the name of this market where people come together to sell and buy food that keeps the city alive. Dulce Maria, with whom I am living, is at La Demo this morning, as she is most mornings, to buy the food that her family will eat that day. She begins at the market's exteriors, taking time to eye and feel the produce. She barters with women as she fills her nylon bags with red peppers and green beans, sesame seeds, plantains, and several goods for which English translation would be disappointing. I won't even try. She then moves to the market center where butchers operate out of wooden stalls. For me, the slabs of meat hanging from large steel hooks conjure up images of violence. The bodies of headless cows bear haunting similarity to the faceless human bodies featured regularly on the front page of the local newspaper. But this family resemblance is simply not there for Dulce Maria. For her, the interior of the market is not a space of death, but filled with delicious abundance of life. The connection I might draw between humans and animals loses intelligibility as we move through the stall searching for food. Her activities are organized by different concerns. It's near the end of the week, and by the time we reach the center of the market, her money is almost gone. We pass a few stalls selling whole cuts of meat before we arrive at one advertising carne molida, which is ground beef. She will use this carne to prepare a favorite entree, separating, separately seasoning it, adding it to peppers, which she drops into battered egg white, and fries to be served with white bread or tortillas. The dish is not typico. She learned it while working as a maid at a, for a wealthy family in the country's capital, but she has prepared it so many times it has lost any sense of being foreign. The meat she works with is also familiar. She doesn't wear gloves or sterilize her cutting board. She's unafraid to touch the meat and works confidently without concern if there's contact between it and her body, between what is raw and what is cooked. When her husband and children arrive at the table, she will proudly serve them the meat, stuffed within the pepper, the center of the pepper placed at the center of the plate. On this day at the market, she tells the butcher to sell her more carne than usual. Holidays are approaching and she will cure a few extra pounds for a seasonal dish. As the meat is being weighed, as it's being dropped into a black plastic bag, I notice a small note on the corner of the stall. De soya, says a tag in the corner, indicating that this is not a meat from cattle, but from soybeans. That afternoon, before her husband and four children begin to eat the feast she has prepared for them, they give thanks for their ability to eat carne in a country familiar, too familiar with famine. It's not every day that they're able to eat meat. In days like this, where it is part of the meal, are more celebratory than others. They bite into the dish, chewing it, chewing with contentment, enjoying the flavors. Okay, so that's the first story. If when hearing it, you were tempted to imagine that Dulce Maria had served her family imitation or artificial meat instead of the real thing, let me suggest that something else might be taking place. Let me suggest that there are multiple ways of making meat come into being, or more precisely, enacting meat, some of which render meat a physiological substance derived from animals, while others do not. John Dupre suggests that the stereotypical framework of species as a stable category has a history in John Locke's theory of real and nominal essences, wherein real essences demarcate natural kinds. 
But whereas taxonomic principles divide species into categories that have an underlying, a, a real, true property, as seen in Dulce Maria's kitchen, life and its substances can be arranged in other, also real, true ways. As meat can take shape through presentation rather than genealogy, something need not be animal to come from meat. <coughs> so the argument isn't that origins are never relevant. Within Maya cosmologies of meat, which most people with whom I lived could easily articulate, what Western taxonomy terms plants is not clearly defined. Sorry. Um, origin, sorry. In Mayan cosmologies, origins are central to the categorization of meat. Although in these articulations, what Western taxonomy terms plants is not clearly divided from what Western taxonomy terms animal. So human flesh, for example, is composed of maize. Do you know maize? Is that um, it's a Guatemalan word? It's like corn. Human flesh is composed of maize, which is itself a fleshy living person. Origins can also matter in Dulce, uh, in Dulce Maria's kitchen, since on Fridays, keeping with Catholic tradition, it's important that she serves fish instead of beef, so carne de res, though de res would rarely be specified. And origins are also important at the local Walmart. Oh, there's a picture of like, the meat she's cooking. Sorry that I didn't turn there. Origins are also important at the local Walmart, which sells its products by stressing associations between meat and the animal from which it came. The shelves of the massive grocery stores are increasingly lined with parts, mechanically deboned slabs, skins, and fats, in which beings have been rendered invisible. But for these products to be palatable to the Highland Guatemala customers, the carcass of the body it came from is staged or represented. So my point is not that it, the origins don't matter, it's rather that meat can be classified through priorities in which origin isn't, it doesn't matter. So it's important that this not be read not as a division between how classification operates in the West and elsewhere. If Euro-American intellectual tradition would have it that a substance is singular with property that can be measured and known, the variation in substance that I'm describing here also emerges within Western repertoires. For example, the Central America US free trade agreement that took effect in Guatemala in 2006 made possible a single category. So it's one category, although it's called meat and animal feed, but it's still classified as one. And poultry, pork, fish, beef, soybean meal, and yellow corn became grouped together as foods exempt from import and export tariffs. Uh, there's uh, if, uh, economists that have noted that lobbyists from the American Soybean Association actively campaigned for CAFTA, the free trade agreement's low import tariffs on meat, as they were confident that soy would be included in the category of meat. So in this mode of ordering, meat is not organized through agricultural histories, but through political and economic negotiations. Meanwhile, in nutrition classes, which have proliferated in Shela in response to increased rates of death from diabetes and heart attacks, nutritionists rarely define meat in terms of its component parts. Sorry, they routinely define meat in terms of its component parts. So here, something in the nutrition classes is meat because it contains relatively high amounts of protein, iron, and B vitamins. When cataloging meat through nutrition, educators will frequently include egg since it is full of protein and will promote it as a more alternative um, meat than beef or pork. Several class uh, different techniques of classification might become salient as Dulce Maria serves soy to her family. And I'll just show you this picture here. I don't know how well you can see it, but here she is buying um, the food from the market. And you can see up in the corner where it says, you know, our meats have, um, are a good source of protein. They have vitamins and, and iron, and that makes them good for a balanced diet. So the, you get a lot of the, these kind of mixtures of repertoires here. So in nutritional terms, soy might become intelligible as meat through its biochemical composition by having comparable amounts of protein, iron, and vitamins to animal flesh. In economic terms, international politics relating to the price of feed and transportation may matter, as beef may cost more than chicken to produce, shaping the possibilities of what people can purchase. And meat may also gain prestige by being doubly rich, full of nutrients, and also expensive. But crucially for my argument here, Dulce Maria is dominated by neither biochemistry nor price in her preparation of the meal. The meat she works with takes its shape as meat through her, the expert techniques by which she cooks and serves it to her family. As she prepares the dish in her kitchen, what she speaks about is taste and texture. What emerges as relevant as she serves it to her family is how it's seasoned and cooked, its place on the its place in in the lunch, um, and its position on the so the lunch, um, unlike dinner where I'm from, lunch is the main dish and, and it's, it's the main gathering of the day. And this meat is positioned at the center of the plate. Um, there's no imitation or deception here. This is a meat she is proud of. 
When Dulce Maria serves this meat, she does so not based on its contents, soy or cow, but because she's working within the possibilities of crafting and preparing a delicious meal. She is not in the business of serving phylogeny. Instead, she serves her family food. That's the first story. The second story here is, is on um, the topic of family. The family gathers every day at half past one. Schools have ended by then, classes starting early in the morning to finish in time for the lunch hour. Martin, the father, also comes home from work as business around the city close at midday. The table is set when he arrives. Forks with bent prongs and soup spoons with flecks of stubborn rust laid on the plastic checkered tablecloth alongside a wicker basket of hot tortillas wrapped in well-worn cloth. Dulce Maria will serve the food in courses, starting with a bowl of broth, then a plate with rice and boiled and fried potato and carrot, and a, and a juice thick with sugar. A few times a week, there will be a small piece of beef or sausage, which is everyone's favorite, but no one complains if there is not. The children wash their hands in the icy tap, in an icy tap before they pile around the table, waiting to eat until they have recited the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Every meal, it's said. Um, and uh, when the prayer ends, Martine regularly makes a small speech about how sitting around the table and eating together makes us family. After I've lived with the family for several weeks, they begin to refer to each one another as Mama Dulce and Papa Martin when speaking to me. Call your Papa Martin to dinner, Dulce Maria would say if he was out of earshot. At first, it feels very strange to use these kinship terms myself, but as the weeks pass, it becomes normalized, familiar. The four children refer to each other as brother and sister and the adults as mother and father, but in a different room is a small picture of another woman to whom two of the children also call mother. Over time, I learn that this mother died giving birth to her second child. Her husband, the child's father, was in no position to care for the two small children. So before leaving the country in pursuit of better work, he delivered them to his sister and her husband. It is this mother and father who have raised them, along with their two children, as his own. And maybe I'll just note that this starts to sound confusing. It's like kinship in Guatemala was often very confusing. Um, but so other family, family members help out. Aunts and uncles re regularly stop by with food and school notebooks or other supplies. The distant father sends money from abroad whenever he can. Martin, the father with whom the children lives, the, the father with whom they live, takes on extra work, spending his weekends in construction yards and atop the buildings he helps to assemble. There is exhaustion, but these are his children, and no one doubts that this is what has to be done. Whereas phylogenetic modes of ordering relations might have that the adopted children belong less to the family than those born into it, this is not the reality around the table where we gather. Martine is full of praise for all four children. Eat more, my dear, my angel, my heart, my life, he encourages them, passing around the basket of tortillas until all have eaten. As Dulce Maria divvies up soup, rice, and the occasional piece of meat, the differences between the children that become relevant pertain to how to use scarce resources to feed those at the table, and not to the ancestry of individuals. After the evening supper, all children pile into the family bed together and wait for their parents to join them. I never hear the terms niece, nephew, aunt, or uncle used to describe their relations. Likewise, cousin is a term the children use for others, but never for each other. When an uncle dies, who in phylogenetic terms is more closely related to two of the children than two of the others, <coughs> the anguish all the children feels, feel renders this an inept technique for classifying their relations. It is, of course, possible that phylogenetic divisions between the two sets of children become relevant when I'm not around, or that they're there and simply not evident to me. But as I watch for this truth of the children's connection to surface in the months I live with them, so I wait for the divisions to fall along, um, along something like genetic lines, it occurs to me that I may be missing that there are simply more relevant truths at play. The truth, for example, that the meals that Dulce Maria makes for her children also make the children hers. And though the picture of the other woman remains on display, when they gather at the table over meals, the family is not necessarily divided or incomplete, so things don't have to be whole to cohere. That eating together can form kinship in the region was a lesson I learned in a different way years before, when I was unable to eat beef floating on top of broth of soup. I served at a housewarming celebration I attended. This was in my early work that was further up higher in the mountains. As a foreigner, I was the honored guest, and unlike any other woman in the room, I was offered a seat at the table, and I was among those served first. But I encountered a problem. 
It had been more than a decade since I had knowingly put the flesh of cattle in my mouth, and though I wanted to participate, I could not bring myself to take this step. I managed to sip the broth as the beads of fat formed on the surface, but I could not choose, chew the pieces. If the fluid was tolerable, muscle, tendon, and, t- and tongue were too much. When those around me realized what I was doing, they laughed at me. The laughter was not entirely gentle. I was peculiar, but I was also offensive, and several people wanted nothing to do with me when the meal was over, moving away from where I was sitting and when I tried to make conversation, responding with silence. I had not only achieved closeness of family, but in refusing the meat, as well as in undertaking this strange behavior of treating my meal as though it could be dissected into parts to be accepted or refused, I had cast myself as unworthy of communication, jeopardizing my status of humanity, as, as human, jeopardizing my own humanity. Before beginning the field work that brought me to live with the family of four children that I talk about today, I thought to change this. I began to train my body to eat what I had earlier rejected so that I would not find myself in the position of refusing both food and the connection entailed by commensality. Food where I lived is typically dished out from a communal pot, and it's uncommon for meals to accommodate personal dietary preferences. So like those with whom I lived, I ate what I was given, and indeed I was treated by, as kin by many. But there's one more story to recount. The family I described, they kept a large jo- dog chained permanently at the doorway. The dog, locked within the household walls, protected the family with its small children from the uncertain dangers of the outside streets. While mother, father, and their children accepted me into their home, fed me, and extended remarkable kindness, never in my months of living did this sharp-toothed creature recognize me as its own, barking and lunging when he saw me. As he was never removed from his chain, he was often covered in his own excrement and mucus, and I was both saddened and frightened by his presence. And though I gave him biscuits and scraps of fat to try to win his favor, it was never enough. Months after my arrival, he still greeted me with fury. Okay, so now I'm going to give a little analysis of that story. Of that, let's call it a story. Um, but the, biology, uh, the biological concept of a species is defined in terms of asexual and sexual relations. Donna Haraway notes that an ability to interbreed reproductively is the rough and ready requirement for members of the same biological species. Phylogenetic maps connect species through descent from common andres- ancestry. Carne, its various species in their flesh, is born from carnal relations and the language of blood ties therein evoked. Anthropologists have illustrated that blood in Latin America has long been conceived as a patchwork of different notions of descent, many of which have nothing to do with determinant fixed inheritance. Yet as 19th century scientific practices of taxonomic classification proliferated, blood became commonly associated with discrete bounded physiological types. An especially notable example of this association Miguel Angel Asturias, eventual recipient of a Nobel Prize, made blood a central focus of his argument for the importance of miscegenation in Guatemala. So he writes in his 1923 dissertation, which is called Guatemalan Sociology, the Social Problem of the Indian. Uh, he writes that the blood of the Indian and the non-Indian needed to mix to reinvigorate the country. In this mode of ordering, blood is treated as the medium <coughs> of heredity. For reasons that lie outside individual control, people are born with certain types of blood, and it's only through sexual reproduction with someone of a different blood type that bloods can mix, changing the blood of the progeny. Tracing lineage through blood clearly affects who may be included and excluded from mealtime tables at Guatemala today, but while relatedness can be formed out of visions of sex and descent, other factors figure in. I saw clearly in my fieldwork that the institutional power of blood relations did not have a stranglehold on kinship. For as strong as this form of genealogy can be, people have long worked around this mode of classifying, assembling families and heredity in other ways. In Dulce Maria's family, temporal and spatial proximity (coughs) also shaped what Marcel Sands has called mutuality of being. Sexual reproduction, the ability to breed, whatever this means in practice, was not a precondition of the formation of this family. It was not only natural essences of blood and semen that mattered, but also eating meals together. Scientific kinds that are interwoven with political imaginaries of essence-based heredity are not without effect, but neither are they overwhelming. In this household, as in many Guatemalan households, meal times made families. To refuse to gather around the table and share in what and how others were eating was not merely impolite, it was a challenge to how pathways of belonging were organized. 
I certainly don't recount the story of sharing meals with my family to suggest that eating meat at the table ensured my inclusion once and for all. The families I lived with knew that I always had the option of leaving for the United States on a journey that would last but a few hours in the relative safety and comfort of an airplane, and that I would pass easily through customs. Rather than imply a false piece of unification, wherein eating together erases differences and creates systems without friction, my point is that visible, official, and taxonomic modes of establishing family are not all that matters. Some modes of belonging are organized through family trees and the recounting of ancestors, but commensality can also make kinship. La familia que, que come unida se mantiene unida. The family that eats together stays together is this classic Spanish proverb. To twist it slightly, those who stay and eat together can also become family. While many academics have been inclined to label the mode of connection built around shared meals as fictive kinship, this presumes an underlying reality to relations that simply did not fit with the practices of Dulce Maria's home. Relatedness made through imagery of blood was not primary and material in this family, whereas meal-made kinship was lesser and symbolic. Though the kinship of eating was not predicated on blood, sex, or notions of determinant inheritance, it was kinship nonetheless. Yet if familia was not a natural category determined by the fixed substance of blood, neither was it infinitely malleable. Rather than organize family around abstract terms, we might instead follow, it through the, follow, the, follow this through the practices in which it becomes relevant. Eating with families granted me inclusion in some situations, but the large angry dog also reminded me that this inclusion was never complete. The dog's own position in the household is telling. In the stillness of the night, as the dog lay in wait, ready to defend the home from attackers, he was family. When morning came and he remained tethered in filth to his post, while the family gathered in the kitchen for beans and eggs, it was not. And even, it was, and even when it was most thoroughly animal, he, or it, these are complicated terms, it never moved into the category of meat. Augustine Fuentes makes the compelling argument that animal species and human species can share personhood, since personhood is based on similar physiologies and shared sensory modalities. My point here is somewhat different, however, as it stresses the organization of categories of belonging through situated practice rather than through structural homology or unification of a physical domain, both of which retain concern for species, like, like given species reproduction. In my account, what comes to matter is what is done, rather than similarity of appearance or perspective. As a result, families can be formed from difference, not merely from resemblance. Moreover, the implications of family diverge. There can be kinship without love or even kindness. Okay, story three, collective. Collective. I'll give you a new picture. This is maize, maize corn. The pews in the church are already crowded by the time we squeeze next to those around us. Some are neighbors, some are less familiar, their faces known but not their names. Conversation fills the space beneath the vaulted ceilings until the priest enters the sanctuary, and even then it takes some time for the chatter to calm. We are in the midst of celebrations for Dia de Defuntos and Dia de los Santos, Day of the Dead and All Saints Day, and the city is rowdy and celebratory. Starting at noon, the restless dead will leave their graves to spend the next cycle of the sun looking for souls to add to the list of those who will join them the next year. The holidays incite people throughout the city to mourn and pay respect to ancestors and to pray for health for the upcoming year. They also mark a shift in season. Throughout the countryside, men and women sweep through the rugged hillsides, cutting the tall, beloved stalks of maize and then covering their rooftops with ears and husks to be dried. What is not exported will be boiled and ground, making a paste that is padded into tortillas served at nearly every meal. And yet when maize is clearly eaten, it is far too integral to life itself to be classified by anyone as mere food. Scientists, sorry, by everyone as mere food. Scientists and doctors that I traveled with were confounded when villagers refused to list maize among other goods consumed on a food frequency questionnaire. It was an originary substance of mankind, a, guard, sorry, a god, a marker of time, a substance that would make and was made of flesh, but not straightforwardly food, and certainly not starch or vegetable. Over the priest's pontifications, the church walls echo with the sound of fireworks. There was widespread enthusiasm for the celebrations marking that maize is life and alive, that it has meat and gives meat to others. As the service draws to a close, another substance taken by plant 
taken to be plant by Western taxonomy, is given flesh. The priest holds up a wafer, asking us to taste the body of Christ. He gave us oil, he gave us bread, he gave us wine, he gave himself, now we take of him. The priest said, those around me step forward to receive the host. I am not Catholic, so I remain behind. The family had recently recounted a story of a young foreigner who, wanting to demonstrate that he was open to other cultures, followed the crowd to the altar to receive communion. He opened his mouth, received the wafer, but then encountered a problem. He did not know what to do. Was he to swallow it, to spit it out? The family was serious when they told me this. The wafer was no mere cracker, but the flesh of God, and stepping forward as the young man did, entering a space where he did not belong, was a grave mistake. What he had taken as simply additive, wheat and water mixed together to form something to eat, did not follow arithmetic's cumulative logic. The mixture made something else entirely. When his confusion became obvious, the service had to be stopped and hundreds kept waiting as the clergyman attempted to reverse the damage of the transgression. The boy's ignorance was no excuse. What he had mistaken for symbolism was anything but. One of the children next to me tells Dulce Maria he wants to stay back too. I'm sorry, remember I've stayed back here. Um, but she wraps his knuckles. Tiene que comer la carne. You must eat the carne, she says adamantly. It is essential that her son take communion because in eating the host, ingesting the material of Christ, he will become, in turn become one with God, as will the others around him. And in this way, they will become united with one another. Communion creates community. It enacts one as communal. This is not mere metaphor, his mother says. This is what happens. As proof, she gestures to the room where the sea of parishioners, men, women, quiche, mom, have gathered together. So her gesture is compelling, but I know of another Catholic church a short walk away where those wearing indigenous traje will not be granted full membership into the congregation. One with God, mortal divisions remain. When the services end, we leave for the home of an elderly couple, the parents of Dulce Maria, where we will celebrate the holiday. Her parents and two of their daughters have not, yet, have not joined us at church because they've converted to Protestantism. They now attend evangelical services held in an unassuming building in a different part of the neighborhood. Unlike the foreigner who did not know what to do with the wafer, they know, but they do not do it. This particular carne they will no longer swallow. When Dulce Maria told me about their conversion, she said she was upset that her mother and sisters no longer shared her God. She mourned that they did not sit together at church and that their communities and with them their bodies had become different. But as we enter her childhood home, the sorrow of her story is no longer apparent. Instead, she and the other women quickly fall into a rhythm of preparing for the afternoon meal. Hunger is growing, and they have much to do. For some days they, now, they have been assembling fiambre. It's a seasonal dish that costs, according to the regional newspaper, more than 300 quetzales, roughly $40. I, uh, I don't know how many $40 is. 30-ish euros, um, and more than I've paid for my room and meals for the week. The same newspaper reports that the three dozen plus ingredients in fiambre symbolized Guatemala's ancestral diversity. So this is a quote from the newspaper. It says, the plate represents the pluriculturality, this is my translation, but, and the multiculturality of the country. The inhabitants of Mesoamerica contribute the vegetables and the Spaniards the sausages that at one time the Arabs had brought. But the special combination of fiambre is eaten in Guatemalan kitchens. One of the most important characteristics of the mixture is the integration of different ingredients with their definitive tastes and characteristics. It is like the mestizaje that happens in the region of Guatemala. So the promise of multicultural integration offered by this dish is seductive. I'll show you a picture. You can't really see it well, but anyway, it has lots of different uh, ingredients in it. Um, the promise of multicultural integration offered by this dish is seductive. A vision in which unity is formed by different ingredients of many cultures has been widely deployed in Guatemalan political circles, a suggestion of tolerance and inclusion. Yet the celebration of multiculturalism often functions, as Hale notes, as a rhetorical alibi that, by reifying essentialist and bounded expressions of group identity, remakes the conditions for racial exclusion. When looking at how fiambre is assembled here, we see considerably more variation than is made evident by the classification of difference into bounded cultures. It was the case that Dulce Maria could not afford to prepare this dish on her own, but she could afford to prepare one or two of the ingredients, and through their combination with ingredients prepared by other women, the meal could take shape. 
What the women contributed was not determined by who was indigenous and who was not. And given the varied preferences for wearing weepills and speaking quiche, these identities were fluid and overlapping anyway. What the women contributed was, was determined by a different set of means. Who had chickens for eggs? Who had well-flavored peppers? Who had time to pickle beets or cure the sausage or soy, as the case was, in brine? Though this was a prestigious dish, food was left on the plate. If it had been a meal of maize and beans,